as we welcome in our online folks, we can say hello. We have a few. <laughs> I know we're waving at a camera. They're waving back, I promise. <laughs> Um, we have a few announcements this morning to lift up to you. Um, as I mentioned, Helen Deal's service will be this week. It will be Wednesday. They're going to have visitation for family members or for friends and family from 1.30 to 2.30 here in the sanctuary. And then the service will be at 3 o'clock at the graveside. So um, if you'd like to come and uh, pay your respects and to let them know that you're praying for them, 1.30 to 2.30 on Wednesday. And then the service at 3 o'clock by the graveside. If you'd like to help prepare food for the family lunch, talk to Penny or Sally. Um, we don't know numbers yet, but they'll coordinate that if you're willing to help contribute to that. If you are a youth leader type person, we have a meeting on Tuesday on Zoom at 8 p.m. to just plan for the spring semester. So uh, write that down if you don't have it written down yet. I look forward to seeing you and to planning exciting events. And if you are a youth person and you have ideas about exciting events or things that you would like to do this semester, you can text me or any of the youth leaders, and we will um, make those a priority as we plan them. And I think that's it. Next week is two cents a meal collection. Other than that, I don't know of any other announcements. Let us worship God together. By now, Joseph was used to angels, and now he needed their timely warnings more than ever. Jesus was barely a toddler, and his trouble with the Roman Empire had begun. <laughs> Jesus, the savior of humankind, becomes a refugee, forced from home by oppression and violence. How might we usher in more life in the face of what feels destructive?
living God, blessed Jesus, guiding spirit. Grant us openness to hear your message. Grant us courage to be your messengers in the world, creating more life in the midst of fear. And with the angel messengers above us, among us, and within us, we say. Please rise and embody, embody your spirit in singing hymn number 119, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. We will sing verses 1 and 3. I invite you to share a sign of the life in Christ with your neighbors. Our younger worshiper, worshipers can come forward for the time with children. Please pass the peace.
So this morning, we are going to talk about the wise men who came to visit Jesus. And I know you probably already know the story, but what were the gifts that they brought to Jesus? What was one? Very good. That's all three of them, right? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Perfect. That's exactly right. So I was reading a little bit about it, getting ready for this, and I discovered that gold is a gift fit for a king. Very good. And so gold is, and I'm thinking about it here, I'm trying to work it out. Gold was to, because Jesus is the king, right, the king of kings. And so it looks like maybe my ballers are just falling. Oh, no, there they are. All right, excellent. So I brought some gold to show you. This doesn't look like gold, but it does have gold in it. It's a conglomerate rock, and it has gold in it. So if you look at it, it's really sparkly. You can touch them. You can touch them sometimes. And these are gold coins, which is much more of what we think of gold, right? So gold was a gold is because Jesus is the king of kings. Yes? All right. Then we have frankincense, and we don't really tend to know a whole lot about frankincense now. But frankincense represents the deity, meaning that Jesus was God. Also really neat. So I brought frankincense for you to smell. Can you smell it? What do you think? <laughs> you don't like it. <laughs> no. It's very strong. <laughs> We're getting mostly grossed out faces. <laughs> Explain it now. <laughs> Actually, it smells kind of good. It's not terrible. You get used to it. So in other words, you don't want this for Christmas, right? No, but Jesus is God. Baby Jesus was God, and so that's why. Frank says, I don't know where the coins went. I put them back in my bag. I don't know where the rock went. Okay, and the last one was what? What was the last one? Myrrh. Myrrh. Okay, who knows what myrrh is? All right. Myrrh was used when somebody died to prepare the body for death and burial. So why do we think we have myrrh? Why was myrrh given to baby Jesus? Why, Isaac, do you? Why do you think myrrh was given to baby Jesus? Something that's used for that's exactly right. Baby Jesus died. And so the wise men brought myrrh. So I brought myrrh for you to smell too. If you didn't like the frankincense, you're really not going to like this one. Yeah. <laughs> so weird. Can you look? Um, get a little closer. What do you think? Okay. What do you think? You didn't, you didn't, you didn't make the face. Isaac likes this one. <laughs> Okay. Okay, I just wanted to know what your reaction was. So really, I think, I thought it was kind of neat that the three gifts that the wise men brought really sum up all of Jesus' life right there. He's the, what was the first one, gold? He's the king of all kings. And frankincense was about Jesus is God, very good, the deity of Christ. And then the myrrh was because... He died for all of us. So how neat is that? Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. That's right. So the story doesn't end with his death. The story ends with his resurrection. Very good, Mary. All right. Let's have a quick prayer. Jesus, thank you so much for the, your life and for these wonderful children. And we pray that we will be more like you each and every day. In your name we pray. Amen. scripture reading this morning is from the gospel according to Matthew chapter 2 and we're going to start with the first verse and it goes like this in the time of King Herod after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking where is the child who has been born king of the Jews for we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage when King Herod heard this he was frightened 
and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it was written by the prophet. Bethlehem and the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for for you from you shall come a ruler who is shepherd to my people. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also find him and go pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen in its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. favorite part of the Christmas story. I don't know, they just seem exotic and different somehow. Like, I don't know, it makes it really cool. <laughs> That's my favorite part of the crush, like the nativity set when you get to put the wise men in after Christmas. Um, it, I don't know, I love them. Maybe it's the gold. And I don't know. But I was in seminary before I realized that there were not three wise men. Have you ever thought about how much of our memories of the Christmas story is shaped by things like the nativity sets we own. In fact, it's probably true that there were many, many wise people. It would have been unlikely for people to have traveled across the deserts in just a group of three people. It wouldn't have taken a large caravan of people. So we're not talking about the three kings so much as we are talking about an entire country, an entire group of people all seeing the star and deciding to follow it. That's interesting, because this journey required a high level of sacrifice. Now, we think about the financial sacrifice of the gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These are expensive gifts. And each item, as Rebecca so cleverly told us, was a symbol of Jesus' life. They picked them out based on the prophecy. It was the way for them to acknowledge the birth of a king. 
they were in some ways um, negotiators or um, sorry, just left my brain. Um, you know, the people who, uh, ambassadors, there we go. <laughs> he was in there. Um, they were ambassadors from the countries that they were coming from. They were negotiating a peace with this new king, right? It was a way of submitting themselves to this baby. And in some ways, that's the bigger sacrifice. Financial sacrifice is one thing. Giving of our treasure is one thing. But to sacrifice their very lives is a whole nother thing. Now, I've kind of always been interested in going to Mars, <laughs> right? Like, doesn't it seem like a cool place to go? Mars, like, it has a cool name. It's red, which is also cool. But you would have to sacrifice two years on a spaceship just to get to Mars, and that seems like it's a little bit too high of a hurdle for me. I mean, the financial cost will set aside. <laughs> Someone in this fantasy will sponsor me to go to Mars, because you need a pastor on Mars, clearly, in case there's an alien who needs conversion, right? I've always wanted to go to Mars, but I'm not willing to sacrifice four years of my life to do it. The wise men did. They sacrificed four years of their lives to travel to see Jesus. Maybe it's not Mars, but it's just about as cool. They sacrificed their time and their talent and their treasure, but also effort and a willingness to never return home. They also had to sacrifice their attention. Now, I know I'm not an astronomer, that that would be also a cool job, but they spent every night looking at the sky. And I go outside every night, and I couldn't tell you what's in the sky. Could you honestly tell me if a new star appeared in the sky at night? No, it required attention, intention. It required them to look for the star. It's a determined search they have for meaning. They were paying attention. They were looking for God to appear. And that's a sacrifice. The sacrifice of their own priorities and a belief that whatever was on the other side of that sacrifice was worth it. Imagine I knew that this journey was going to be hard. It was going to be a putting aside of the former things, of maybe their comfort, maybe their lives. But they knew that the end was worth it. Which is where we get to Herod. Now, Herod is probably the great villain of the Bible. I mean, we have Pharaoh in Moses' time, and then we have Herod. These are the two villains, and both of them are villains because of one thing. They don't look. They don't look. Not really. They're not really looking. They're not really open to the possibility that God might be speaking to them. Their ears and their eyes are not quite tuned into the frequency of God. There's no hint in the Bible that Herod was a bad king yet. He does some bad things in a minute after the end of this story. But there's no hint that, that Herod at this point was unjust or unrighteous or any of those things. But the choice not to see the truth of the star is what makes him a villain. It's what informs all of the choices that come after that. The Bible tells us this, that after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, wise men came from the east asking, where is the king of the Jews? And then Matthew continues with these words. When Herod heard this, he was afraid. And all Jerusalem with him. I can't help but wonder if King Herod, who gets everything else wrong, might have been a little bit right. The star was a fear-striking thing. It was a thing that changes the world. And Herod saw it and knew it and chose to turn away. Now, people knew, I think. People knew that this star was not good news for them, not in the way that they meant it, because the world was on the edge of things. The world was on the edge of things because Rome was about to splinter. And when Rome, when the people who are in charge of ensuring that your life is, you know, safe and 
taken care of and not overtaken by random tribes or whatever starts to splinter, it becomes a problem. You see, Caesar Augustus became dictator of Rome in 27 BC, and that was the end of Roman democracy. They had a bunch of emperors who followed, and each one was a little bit worse than the one before them. I mean, I think all of us know about um, Nero, who literally burns Rome to the ground, or so the story goes. And if you think it was bad for people in Rome, think about how much worse it was for people on the edges of the empire when they lost the protection that was given to them. Think about what they were experiencing in Jerusalem. They knew the world was on fire, and they saw a star, and they heard the news of a king, and it was not good news. So they didn't want to look. They didn't want to see. They didn't want to know the truth. They didn't want to see the reality of what was coming to them. So they turned away. They were afraid of the good news. So my question for you this morning is, what does the star look like to you? If you saw a star appear in the night, would it give you a good feeling? Would you approach it with a willing heart? Is the idea of a new year one that brings you joy because there's possibilities that are coming? Does it make you think of the words, good news? Does it make you hear the words that the angels said to you, do not be afraid? Or are we more like Herod? Aware of the truth, but unwilling to approach it, to see it. Does this story call it, cause us to worry? The Reverend Maxwell Grant puts it this way. Sometimes when we speak of new, I think what you and I mostly mean is something more along the lines of improved. You know, the same, but not the same. So often it seems as if we pray only for a vague version of the here and now. And the fact is that much of the time, even faithful people can't imagine a world that's different from the one they already have. And that's the point of the story. Of course we can't see it. We can't. We're not astronomers looking at the stars. We're not the baby in the manger who see the glory of the Lord. We can't see it, and that's because we're people. But we can choose to look for it. We can live with the intention of seeing God at work in the world and receiving that as good news. Our steps towards the future, they may be small, they may be incremental, they may be two steps forward and one step back, or three steps back sometimes, but they are steps. And we can choose which direction they go. Are they steps that lead us towards the manger? Are they steps that follow that star in the night sky as good news? Or are they the ones, the steps that cause us to retreat further in? Are we locked in our palaces, afraid of a baby? This morning, the star invites us to name those fears. To name the fences which keep us from stepping towards the star. The things that keep us from following to the stable, the magi. Do not be afraid. The angels say, do not be afraid because Jesus is the light over the horizon. It is good news whether it feels like good news every day. Do not be afraid, the Magi tell you, because I've walked this road through the journey. I know the sacrifices that it requires. I know how hard the steps are, but the star is over the stable. And that is good news. Take heart, Jesus tells us. It is I. Do not be afraid. We can make a choice, and we can live in the darkness of Herod's palace, surrounded by all the comforts in the world. Or we can walk in the light of the promise of God that shines over the horizon, which may be way scarier and way more difficult. But we shouldn't let fear be the reason we stay. Do not be afraid. For it is good news in the stable. Amen.
Now, scattered around the sanctuary is stars. There are stars, and I invite you to grab one of them. Everyone gets a star, even if you're a small person. You may need to come downstairs and get more stars if you're in the balcony. Now, some of you may still have your stars from when we did this two years ago. And if you did, I invite you in this moment to turn the star over that you have in your hand and to think about how that star impacted your life. So whatever your star was before, and maybe you didn't have a star, and that's okay. You can think about this too. How has the last two years since we last impact had these stars been impacted by your walk with God or by your star word, whichever one that you have available to you? So I invite you to turn your star over and just write a word on it. If you don't have, if you're at home, there's a link in the Zoom, in the Zoom chat or in the YouTube link to the star word. Since the two years since we last celebrated Epiphany together, how has your life changed? How has that word informed that change? Then I invite you to turn your star over. And there's a word on there, and you didn't get to choose your word. God chose it for you. And I, well, I take my star and I put it in the front of my, um, my notebook, my journal, my planner that I use every day. Some people put it in their wallet. I've seen you in the wallets or in, on their refrigerator or wherever that you will see it every day. And I invite you to take that with you and just put it where you will see it. My word is adventure. So good luck, guys. <laughs> so I want you to look at your word and to think about this word as we join together in prayer. In this moment, we pray for all the ways we are in need of life. We hear the message of God. Do not, Do not be, be afraid. afraid. In this moment, we give thanks for all the ways we have experienced God's presence among us, in the words and actions that bring life in the midst of despair. For all who proclaim your reign on earth, we join their refrain, do not be afraid. Paul's letter to the Hebrews includes a wonderful word. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some have entertained angels without knowing it. As we enter experience the season of Christmas, Jesus Christ invites us all, no matter whether we feel at home in our faith or at times feel like strangers, to know the grace of God is already and always waiting for us if we will but be open to it. In this silence, we offer to God our confession of the ways we turn away from the fullness of life. Know this, the things you have confessed before God, and even those things you have no words for at this moment, washed away by God's love. Be assured of your freedom as forgiven and beloved children of the most gracious God, and all God's people sing.
Touch us, O Spirit, with your transforming power. Open us to your promise of resurrection from fear and death. Let us become messengers of peace in all that we say and do. Make us one in this purpose, O God. Make us one in your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to stand and join in singing hymn number 136, verses 1 and 3. choice which direction our steps take us, towards the manger or back into our palaces. And I invite you this year to consider which direction you're choosing, and to live your life with an intention of not being afraid, but to trust in the good news of God. Now I invite you to open your arms so you may receive the benediction. May the grace of God, the love of Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and into the life everlasting. Amen.